Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Wednesday morning mastermind call with Daily Refinement. Um, today, our topic is what's working for resellers ain't pretty. Um, so I want to go over some things that work. And I have something really good that I think <clears throat> is going to help a lot of people down. And if they write this down, I think it'll really help them. Okay. So we all know that selling amazing items for a lot of profit really quickly, high profit really fast. That's what everyone is striving for. But sometimes you pick up an item that's cheaper or sells for less money, but you're, but you're like, oh, I'll just pick it up because it'll sell fast and I'll get a smaller profit. I don't actually think that that works. I think that if you have cheaper items, they actually sell slower. It, it does work in a sense that if you have a very, very big store, then you have enough items where some cheaper items could sell. But I actually think that cheaper, larger works. Cheaper, larger. So if you have a big selection. Big selection works. Cheaper and larger. But cheap store, not a very good selection. I don't think that that works. You have to have a big store. In the media category, Jamie's talking about, the, the media game has been around for a long time. I would say the top, in the top 10 stores on eBay worldwide, eight of them are media stores, CDs, magazines, books. And they are the biggest stores in the world, literally. They have like two, three million listings. Um, a lot of media sellers are in the 100 to 500 new listings a day. And... If you were to be a bookseller or a magazine seller and you only had 80 magazines in your store, I think you would really struggle, especially if they were cheap. Cheap magazines and only 80 of them in your store, I don't know if that's going to work out. So I think that cheaper, larger, slower works. But I don't think that cheap and fast are really... I don't think that that really works because... I'll give you guys an example um, in the t-shirt game, brand new t-shirts, brand new t-shirts at Walmart, Old Navy, Costco, Target, Sam's Club, all of the major retailers shirts sell for between $6 when they're on sale, actually $4 when they're on sale and all the way up to $25. This is just like a basic reprinted t-shirt. Everybody knows what these are at Kohl's. I've seen them as low as $3. This is like um, Super Nintendo, Mario, Yoshi, um, Grateful Dead, any, anything that they reprint on a t-shirt, it's like between $3 and $25 at the store. Now, you would think that a lower price would make them sell faster, but I don't know if that's true. Like at Kohl's, a Mario shirt that's $3, you would think that would be sold out. Like even me, when I went to the store, last time I saw it, I was like, should I just resell these? They're $3. Like even with 10% tax here, that's $3.30 for a brand new t-shirt. Should I just buy all of them? And the guy was like, this is what the guy said. They'll probably sit. This is what the guy at the store said. Because I'm like, do you guys have a reseller policy? He's like, no. Um, we, we, don't, we don't like it when resellers come here and try to abuse coupons. But if you want to buy all these shirts for $3, be my guest. I think they're going to sit though. So what do you guys think? On eBay, these shirts probably sell like Nintendo branded licensed t-shirts. They don't sell for that much money and it does take like a pretty long time for them to sell. So I think that good items, even if they're cheap, good as in like, it's a good graphic or, or good style, but then there's just so many of them in the marketplace. I don't think it moves very quickly. So Meg says she only regrets picking up and listing cheaper items on the days where those end up being most of her sales. That's the conundrum. But I think that you have most of your sales being those items because you have a good amount in your store. So the reason why I said what's working for resellers ain't pretty is because sourcing better items kind of sucks. Okay, like it means you're sitting in front of your computer doing online arbitrage, being really specific, looking through a thousand listings to buy two. You're buying a lot, uh, like a lot of a hundred items. You look through the whole thing, only list seven of them, put the other 93 
in a big bulk listing and sell it for $19 and then just keep your good items. It's not fun to source only better items. That's why I think so so people so few people do it. I'll give you an obvious example, but like I've heard from a billion, not really, like uh, I don't know, sixty different bodybuilders that like you can only get skinny by just changing your diet. It has not really nothing to do with your exercise, and really the easiest way to do that is just to have an extra serving of vegetables. It's like the easiest way, but who in the hell wants to do that? Anybody here want to eat an extra serving of vegetables with every meal? Who wants to do that? But you, you would just be full. I, 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 I've been doing it this week because today I tried my um, one rep max and I wanted to like be as healthy as possible. After one more serving of vegetables, you're just not hungry. You just, just, it fills you up. If you guys were to source only good items, you would have no interest in picking up bad items. It's just that, Junk items, junk food is easier. Junk food's way easier. You go to the store, you know, there's a handheld game system. You're like, oh, these, these are pretty cool. It's like only been used twice. It sells for $17.99 on eBay. It's $2. I'll pick it up. That's fun, but that's just, that's junk food. Right? There's something better than that. Even though it's two in the 17, it could, it's not going to sell fast because only a few people are looking for those vintage games might be in your store for 12 months. So crowding out bad habits is good ones. I was trying to think of every day I need to leave you guys with something that I feel like is really meaningful to me. And I feel like crowding out bad habits with good ones is the topic for today because it's not fun, but cheaper, larger, slower. That's what people need to write down. You want to go cheaper. That means you have to have a larger store and sales are going to be slower. If you're okay with that, then go ahead and pick up the cheaper item. Don't pick up the cheaper item thinking it's going to sell faster because it's cheap. That, that's like a, that's probably reseller mistake. Number one that causes bad buying. Cause if it's said on a cheaper item, if it just said right on it, Catherine, this item is probably going to sit. Do you still want to buy it? Right. Then you might you might say you know I don't I don't even want it if it's free because I really don't want my store to sit for a long time. But man, sourcing higher profit items sucks. It's like the um, there's there's basically two things we can do as resellers: we can improve our personal performance, or we could source better items. Actually, does that what do you guys think? Do you guys want to just remain the normal skill you're at right now? and just source better items? Or do you also want to improve your process? Oh, I 100% want to improve my process and mm -hmm. source better items. And the reason why is because I've done both at various times and then not been consistent with those changes. And I, I mentioned like a couple of weeks ago, I think that I only want to source at the bins once a month and get my 200, 300 items for the month and then source my jewelry online and not go thrifting every week because it's a time suck. And when you go to this thrift store and then drive 10 minutes to the next thrift store and you go every week, you're looking through items that you looked through the last week. Yep. Seems like a waste of time to find the ones that they added in. Yep. When at the bins, every bins that they pull out, they're not pulling out the items from last week, you know? Yeah. So I feel like I get um, more variety. I can find better items. I can find brands that I can't find in my area. Now, last week, I couldn't go because of the winter storm we had. So I'm going to go this next weekend. But so now I'm out of clothing inventory. So today I have to go source. And I'm going to have to just bite the bullet and go to this thrift store and that thrift store and sort through clothes that I've already seen and try to find some bangers to get me through the rest of this week. Go this way <laughs> there <laughs> because of the sun, I saw the comment. But um, the other thing is that yesterday I um, got all my listings and work done early, which I've done occasionally. 
And I spent, my husband left for the rest of the week to go work on our lake cabin, took our dog. So the minute he walked out the door, the door was locked. I was in my introverted mode, quiet, had my music going. <laughs> Nobody was going to disturb me. And I painted and I painted and I painted. And it was so great. I was so in the zone. Four hours flew by. Then I stayed up till midnight looking at painting videos and painting books. And it, it was so difficult this morning to walk by my painting that I'm working on and not want to pick up the brush because I know what the next step is on this painting. Mm. I'm not in a stuck place on it. And I just wanted to get to it, which motivates me to do everything faster today so I can get to it. So I'm, I've got to improve that process. And I've also got to improve my listing. Catherine, my that, my that, sourcing, I mean. My that is a very good analogy. Um, because I actually think of my business as a painting, 100%. I can't wait to wake up and finish it. It's not done. Yeah. Right? And I, I, and sometimes you get stuck and then you got to kind of step back and go, well, what's wrong yeah. with this? What's wrong That's with right. this picture? And sometimes you have to paint over a tree. Yes. Right. As painful as that is. As painful and sometimes as it you is. Paint yes. over the really good stuff because it will be even better. Yep. And that's hard because you kind of get an affection for certain parts of your business. I really like the way I do this. It runs okay, but maybe it's not the best way to do it. And you don't, you kind of lose that. You have to lose that to make it even better and love it even more. So I think that a lot of things with reselling are actually um, kind of, like things, details that you may not notice. Or like one detail is the difference between you getting a great price for the item and the item sitting and for a low price. You can make one tweak and it would adjust it. So when I used to play competitive chess, um, my teacher said, acknowledge the good moves, but look for a great move. Most of the moves on the table are okay. There's probably three to five good moves and there's one great move so your job is to just be patient use as much time as you have and look for the great move the good moves are okay and they'll still be there but just try to look for the great move and when you get really good at chess you can only see the you just everything is you can only see the great moves all the other ones just go away and I, that's how we're trying to how we're trying to do it at the um at the thrift store, there's so many good items, right? We need a great item though, to prevent our store from being big and bulky. Right now, since I'm focusing on great, my store is shrinking like crazy. All my inventory, that's not, it's like, um, it's hard to like grasp this until you start moving in that positive direction. You can see the progress happening. And anybody here, you, you feel like your store is shrinking but getting better? Does anybody have that feeling? Or do you have the opposite feeling where you feel like your store is getting bigger but bloated? Like it's getting, you're getting more and more full, but the sales aren't. Mine for sure is shrinking and getting better. Yeah. And after yesterday, I was so energized today to start the day because I had had that painting time yesterday. And the smaller my store gets, you know, I've been going through my bins, the, the better the items are that are in it and they're moving faster. But also just carving out more time for myself made me want to get up and do this job more because hmm. I could see how much better it could be. And that just energized me. I was so excited this morning. Um, Can you... Is there a way to relate that to um, can you relate the painting analogy to your own reselling business? Oh yeah, definitely. Because, How do you do? Okay. Well, so what can you not wait to work on? In my reselling? Yeah. Oh, get reselling my painting. get my items listed and my my items shipped like as soon as possible. Okay. I, 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 
barely even wanted to come onto this call because I just wanted to like get going. <laughs> I love it. Um, I wonder if we can get, does anybody else have that feeling that they can't wait to work on something? Is there anything else in the business that you guys have that feeling like you can't wait to work on it? Jamie's saying, why, why do they call it competitive chess? I think it's just that um, a tournament atmosphere where you try, you like win and move on to the next round. Um, like if we were doing um, a thrifting battle, right? And it was just Brian versus me at the at Salvation Army. Um, and it was one hour to go get as many items as possible with the um, highest yield but it only counted if it's sold in 90 days. So it's weird because with reselling, it's like a 90 day clock. That's why people don't mind picking up garbage because the clock is so far. But imagine if you were um, the Play-Doh's closet flipper at the bins. What that means is Play-Doh's Closet or Closed Mentor or Crossroads or do you, does everybody have a store in their area that does buy, sell, trade? Anybody? So Meg has Play-Doh's Closet. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Do you guys have a place that's buy, sell, trade? Okay. So let's say that your timeline is today because if you go to Play-Doh's Closet or Closed Mentor or Crossroads, and they have a 1 p. you have to drop off the stuff by 1 p.m. So you get there at 9 You own, when they open. You only have until 9 till noon to get as many items that you can get at the Play-Doh's Closet once. And um, you have to drop off by 1 to get paid that day. Um, you would be, you would first go to Play-Doh's and say, hey, what do you guys need? And they'd be like, oh, Catherine, we need um, flannel shirts. Doesn't matter what brand. Every flannel shirt will pay you six dollars for because we're going to charge twelve ninety nine to eighteen ninety nine at the store. We're looking specifically for red, yellows, and blues. Um, and you're like, okay, and then they're like, oh, we're also looking for t shirts with these graphics. We're also looking for in my Play Doh's closet. They look for stuff that's still on the website. They will pay you good money, basically like. Um, they try to sell it for a third of what it's on the website for. So if J Crew has a top for $80, they're going to put it in Play-Doh's Closet for $24, and they want to pay you a third of that. So they want to pay you $8 for that item. So $8 for a J Crew item is pretty good. You could go to the bins and probably find one. You could probably find one piece of J Crew that's currently still in the store that everybody else passes on because they don't want to sell J Crew for $12.99 plus shipping on eBay to go through the work of photographing and listing it. But imagine you had no inventory. All you did was just fit, go to Play-Doh's and you know the manager and they tell you what items they're looking for and you just shop for them. Your turnaround is one day. There's a wholesale page on Instagram with this business model, except for they sell wholesale to other resellers called Trash Panda Wholesale. I love it. <clears throat> so um, typically people who think they are great buyers just like to shop. But um, I have a, an idea for you guys. I'm going to write this one down. What if you guys just fulfilled orders instead of looking for customers. So right now there's an insatiable demand for rare cool items. So if you guys find those, it's awesome. But if you find the common items, now you have to like beg, 
and market and promote and bundle to get people to buy it. Jamie says the prices are close to half of retail. I love it. Yeah, it really depends on, on, on what model you're looking at. But I, I just really like the idea of fulfilling orders. Go ahead, Lauren. So I'm thinking about this concept and if, if fulfilling orders, would it be like you're shopping seasonally for Play-Dohs? You know, they're looking for trendy fast mover pieces. So you go into the bins and you have that customer in mind. Like they're looking for corset tops. They're looking for graphic tees. They're looking for men's swimwear. And then that is your customer as you're like shopping. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah. Another thing I've been seeing lately is um, that some people will have like curated mystery boxes um, and that's how they're like marketing to the customer. So they will they will have a buyer like send them their Pinterest board and then they will like go out as a personal shopper and it's like five pieces for one hundred and twenty dollars. But it's like curated to whatever this person's like. They want a chunky knit sweater. They want a maxi skirt. They want, you know, this certain like Pinterest girl aesthetic. And then they're being like a personal shopper, um, which is kind of interesting if, you know, you're like focusing more on the style, less on the brand. Um, that's, I think, where Plato's Closet makes all of their money because it's like a, so much easier to get an off brand on style than it is to get an on style on brand. That's eBay. eBay is so much more difficult. On style, on brand. You know what? I think that if you're good at eBay, you can sell anything because it's so more, much more competitive than any other market. Like go into a store with the eBay app open. Doesn't the store look stupid? Have you guys ever been to a store with the eBay app open and been like, why is the internet so bad in here? And they're like, because no one would buy anything if we had good internet here. Because we charge five times more than eBay. Like literally, is it? there's like not one item at the store that's cheaper than the eBay app. Right? And yes, you have to wait nine days for your eBay seller to ship it to you. But it's like really a lot cheaper. Isn't that crazy? I am... Um, I have a neighbor that is a pizza connoisseur. Well, they call themselves that pizza connoisseur family. And then they invited us over for pizza. And I was excited because I'm like, these are pizza people. Like, I'm so excited to see what kind of pizza they picked for pizza night. And they picked five different grocery store pizzas, little mini ones. And, and they're like, we're going to taste test and figure out which of these is the best tasting. And I was like, what the hell? We're not just going to order good pizza that you guys already know is good. We're going to test grocery store pizza. Oh my God. Pass. Next time, don't invite me. <laughs> I'm not going to that. That's like a, you know how we don't want to sell things that are $9 free shipping. That was a $9 free shipping hangout. Horrible. I don't want to do that. There are so many people here in the group that are $30 and over plus shipping. I'll hang out with you. That's good enough for me. You don't have to be a $2,000 plus shipping person. Just the quality, like I would love to have, um, and, the, and like no offense to that family, but their um, conversation is not good enough to compensate for the pizza, right? I would be embarrassed to invite somebody over to eat and I'm a pizza connoisseur and then I serve grocery store pizza. That would be embarrassing. <laughs> it's like they're trying you know, to lose you as a friend. Oh no, I was like, I was like, this one's not bad. That that that's that's what I could come up with while eating the pizza. And I was like, it's acceptable, but it's not what I was thinking. I wouldn't have come over here because I can do that at home by myself. I don't need I don't need to. Um, but it's true. So Jamie is saying we all have that frozen pizza place that we love. I agree. I, I'm actually a fan of frozen pizza. All of it, all of it's good to me. 
I'm not, I'm not snobby. I just thought it was interesting. I like that going to us. Like if you, if I, I, I like craft beer, if you came to my house, I wouldn't serve you Coors Light. It's not my, you know, I could say come over for some Coors Light and it would be fine. Just like misadvertised. That's why it left me with a weird, weird taste in my mouth. Um, oh, it was, it was a total, I mean, I made the best of it because I was already there. So Lauren says she started looking for items as she looks at TJ Maxx. So I think that's a great way to look at it. Um, Isaiah texted me and he's like, how come you want to be like TJ Maxx? And I'm like, because I want the TJ Maxx customer. You know, TJ Maxx customer, they have kind of an idea of what they're looking for, not but not exactly. That, that's the customer that I want. They're looking for a dress. Hopefully we have a dress that matches your needs or it's a good enough deal that you'll consider it. Um, I want that customer. The really specific customer, that's a different kind of store. Right? Like, um, does anybody here know someone who collects um, Funko Pop or collects something and they really care about the condition? That's a more difficult customer. So Jamie, if he's selling magazines, right? He has different kinds of customers. He has a customer looking for a perfect magazine, probably. Probably has that customer. And he, that person might reach out to Jamie with six questions about a particular magazine, right? He also might have somebody just looking to fulfill the collection and they don't care about the condition. They just want to have all of them. It's just different in who you choose to serve. And I think I want, does anybody, everybody know what customer they're looking for? I think I want the TJ Maxx customer. They want a good deal. They kind of know what they want. They're going to spend about a hundred dollars. You know, they kind of shopping for fun. The, the really serious boutique customer, that's a different experience. You have to have a different, different everything. Like hopefully you guys can go to the UK and go to Harrods in London and go to the shopping salons where you can sit down and someone will bring you the rare treasures of the earth with white gloves. Catherine, you look like you need a $30,000 scarf, right? And you didn't even know that existed, but they bring it to you and they tell you the story and who made it and which sheep and the sheep's name and what the sheep ate. And you're like, wow, this is a glorious scarf. Thank you. And then they bring you something else. That's a very different experience than a flea market. Everything is on the floor. One dollar, five for four dollars. Yeah, the real real has 50% returns. It's really a killer for them. It was such a killer that they charge back the reseller that consigns the item. Can you believe that? TJ Maxx customer is okay with the little flaws. Oh, you know what? You know what the TJ Maxx customer says when there's a flaw? Oh, that's why it's so cheap. It's so different. Oh yeah. So um, something of uh, um, eBay calls people who buy on eBay. Let me see. Hold on. They call them super buyers. I'm trying to figure out what. I forgot. It's something like eBay has super buyers that buy twice a month all year. They consider that like exceptional eBay customer. Somebody that shops and buys two things on a month on eBay, 20 things a year. Um, but I know that, you know, the Pareto principle, definitely 80% of the stuff on eBay is purchased by 20% of the people, 100%. There's people who love buying on eBay, love buying on Temu, love buying on Wish, love buying on the real, real guilt. People are sometimes pretty loyal to what they want. Is that customer a TJ Maxx shopper or is that customer um, a curator who wants very specific items? I don't think the TJ Maxx customer is that picky because TJ Maxx people and Ross, TJ Maxx and especially Ross. Ross is like, is a Ross nice where you guys live? It's not nice here. Not really. So who is, 
Ross is number one. Did you guys know that? For discount retail, Ross sells more stuff than any other store. But how or why? Is it because people really don't care? Because if you walk in there, Fila sandals for $17.99 doesn't feel like a good deal to me. But I mean, they have Fila sandals there for sure. We have Ross, and then we have TJ Maxx. I would say here, Marshalls is slightly better than TJ Maxx, and Home Goods is is good is about the same as Marshalls. I don't know how you guys feel about walking around in those stores, but I prefer the customer that was looking for a good deal. Um, the picky collector customer the picky collector customer I think the picky collector customer is the most happy customer though it's just kind of hard to earn that picky yeah if it goes customer. well <laughs> go ahead I was just saying yeah if it goes well then they're the happiest yeah. If it goes well, they're really happy. Um, hmm. I don't know if that is a sustainable model as a reseller to only sell the collectors. I feel like that's pretty difficult. Because um, it's just not as many sales. Jamie, go ahead. I've actually... Uh... I was um, putting in the title on certain magazines, a selection of them I had that they were gear mint gradable because they were. I mean, they were literally the perfect magazines, brand new. Um, I took that off and I've actually, I took that off and I've, I lowered my price on those magazines, a dollar or two each, just because those people are so hard to work with. Like they're expecting a, a CG rated 10 magazine to show up in the, in the mail. Um, and if it's not, then they freak out. So I completely took that off there. I would, I would love not to work with those people. It's much more difficult. Yeah. They, um, it's almost setting yourself up for, it's like, um, when you're a collector, you're either, you get what you want or you're disappointed. You can't really be like, get something better than you thought if you're a collector, because collector perfect is the expectation. Right. So it's either perfect or not good. So that's okay. not a, it's difficult to serve. Another thing that's hard is like a rating of very good. I mean, if you ask, what do you think a rating of very good is? A rating of very good is normal. It's the like it's average. Yeah. So people don't, and a lot of people don't get that. Like they get something and it's got like a little bump or something on it and they freak out. You said this was very good. So it's a, it's a really tough market. I think good is is different than very good. Like I think that good is good is considered junk. Like with good, you can have That's scratches crazy. and 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 corner bends and and pictures. Yeah, but very good is actually just like the run of the mill. If you have a, a, a magazine subscription and you know they sit on your end table and then you throw them in the cabinet. That's what considered very good is gently, normally read, gently read. And yeah, but it's a hard one. Yeah. I think, I think for clothing, very good is different than good. I guess for every category, they have their own grading system, but I think that it's difficult to use words beyond good because anything above good some people are going to think means perfect. Some people think very good means perfect. It means it's been looked at. So it's no longer perfect. That's very good, right? Um, so it just depends on the person. But I think the TJ Maxx customer um, is just so different than the boutique. A, a TJ Maxx has 10 trailers of clothing in it. And a 
boutique has a thousand items in it. There's a store here called Urban Desires. They have 25 items for sale. I mean, like you go in there, if those 25 items don't suit your fancy, then you leave. But if one of those 25 items does suit your, your fancy, if, if Catherine walks in and she really wants this leather studded vest that's purple, then she's got to shell out $325 for it because for this person to afford rent in the Bay Area and to only offer 25 items, they're going to come in and style you in this purple studded vest and talk about where you're going to wear it how it doesn't match anything in your current closet. So you also need to pick up the matching purple pants that are suede, suede pants, which you, you didn't even know was a thing, but now you have to have them. Those are another $495. So now you're $900 poor, but you got extreme customer service. And you know the person's name, you know their birthday, you know they're Sagittarius, and you're psyched. I don't know. I don't know what's more worth it. Or do you just go to TJ Maxx, spend a hundred dollars, go home with eight new pieces of clothing and you're jazzed. Cause like people buy stuff on eBay, if it doesn't match what they want, they throw it away. They don't even return it. The real real has 50% returns because wannabes buy the stuff. And then they return it. A lot of influencers buy it and then return it. But like you want Gucci, but you can't afford the $8,000 price tag. So you buy one of the real real for 4,000. Get it. It's not what you thought. You return it. It's so weird how used Gucci has a higher return rate than new Gucci. Right? You buy a super high end bag. You're like satisfied because you got what you were looking for. On eBay, a lot of people use good when it has flaws. This item is in good condition. Has scratches on surface and a chip on the back. Does that sound like not good condition for you guys? What do you think? I think it's good to be the TJ Maxx of magazine selling. I think that's a good model. I'm, I'm totally cool with that. There's It's like... Being the shopping salon for magazines, that would be so hard. Imagine if Keith went in and they're like, let me guess, you want to read modern trucking? We have three, one from 1979, one from 1989, and one from 2004. They're in various conditions. One is $1,199, one's $1,399, one's $699. That's, the price point is so low for like at the work. I think the um, the polar opposite of the boutique is because we have TJ Maxx and some people are saying that Ross is kind of trashy, but then what do you consider a flea market or a garage sale? If if Because Ross is a lot nicer than most people's garage sale. Have you ever been to a garage sale where they don't even take it out of the box? That's amazing to me. You go to a garage sale and it's just 10 boxes unloaded from their garage on the lawn. <laughs> those are sometimes the best deals but man that that is just like the laziest presentation um becky says she hates digging through boxes ross has a lot of factory defects they don't disclose yeah, that's 100 percent true ross have you guys seen um i think every ross in america has like ten dollar levi's that have something wrong Lauren says maybe people who are collectors are happier because they're clear on what they want. I think so. I just think that collectors should buy in person. That's the problem with buying online is it's always, what do you guys think? When you get something in the mail from online, is it usually as expected or worse than expected or better than expected? Better, as expected, or worse? Meg expects it to be worse. How many people here expect it to be worse? I do. 
I expect it to be late and worse. <laughs> so when it's not late and it's not worse, I'm ex I'm 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 like this is this is a good day. Yes, he makes that she's overjoyed. So you're a pessimist. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a I'm a pessimist, but I does it make me happier? Cuz it every pessimist because then you're always like pleasantly surprised. Everything is is um better than I think usually. So when you started dating your wife, were you like, this probably won't work out? It probably won't work out. She's probably not who she says she is. She probably looks different. She probably looks and then different. You were pleasantly like, surprised. And then it was totally different. <laughs> That's why I like no makeup. Because then you're like, oh, okay. That that's it. That's Chris, you know how you like dating shows? Okay. I love dating shows. Yeah. Me too. So did you see that one dating show where that guy, The Love is Blind, where he like freaked out when he saw the girl without the makeup? Yes. That was crazy. He like, he's like, you're false advertising and you're doing this. And he like literally broke up with her because I know he didn't like her. He was so mean about it too. Like he actually was mean kind of, but uh, I, I mean, that's, that's the part that I don't, it's not cool that he was mean, but like the, I understand the like, misrepresentation parts like you know like the yeah, lady he didn't want a girl that paid yeah. so much attention to her looks i know there's also he, later so that she looked like megan fox and then she didn't yes i remember that one she kind of did though um, like a little bit kind of did a little bit but i, I was you know you, she you, was gotta, great, you, gotta, you gotta be more specific if you're saying that yeah like, you can't be I know like, what you mean. you because know, because if you say you kind of look like megan fox some people are going to think dead ringer looks exactly like Megan Fox. Right. So I, I probably, thought she did. I thought she kind of did though. A little bit, yeah. but I think she was that, cray cray. She needed help. You like that show Catherine too? You watch it? I, wouldn't I just it. watched one season. I didn't think I would like it. And I was absolutely hooked, which I hated. I know, about right? Myself. I could have been reading Shakespeare and I watched freaking love is blind and was hooked into it. <laughs> <laughs> but Pumpkin. yeah yeah those are great shows i i like the um yeah because i always wonder can they make it work like that that's the part that i i um and you know if people have the right foundation just like with reselling it should it should be okay but it's like which is i think i think it's a, a it's like this do you do you have like similar religious background do you have a similar financial goals right are you on the same page about how you spend your time? That that's really it. If one like one girl was not okay with the guy going out, she's like, I don't like guys that go out. And then she was with a guy that likes to go out. It was like that's like a zero percent chance of working. Why would you stop? Why would you do that? One person's like, they have to grow up Catholic. The other person's like, don't want the person to grow up. My, my kids are not growing up Catholic. How would that possibly work? Why would you start that relationship? That would be like you, you know, you want to sell magazines, but you only go, you only go to TJ Maxx. They don't have used magazines there. Right. So I just want people to. I mean, the takeaway that I want from today is I don't think cheaper items sell faster. Chris, do we still have availability to that calculator that you made? That I can't find it anywhere. Yeah, I have it still. So. All right. If you put it in the chat for me, then I can use it to, because I'm, I'm trying to get my plan going here. Thank you. People like projects, even when they say they don't, just like in reselling. It's true. Um, and so Catherine, I think love is blind is interesting because it's just like thrifting, right? You go and you don't really know what to expect. And sometimes there's a crazy gem because, you know, like, um, like in this past season of love is blind, they asked a whole bunch of like really good questions. Like sometimes the couples were like, Hey, um, what do you do with your spare time? What do you do when you're, what is your default mechanism for when you're having a bad day? 
what happens? Like if you're having a bad day, what happens? That's a good question to ask when you're dating somebody. That's like a good jam. But some of it's like trash TV. But if you're watching The Crown on Netflix and they spent $200 million making that TV show, then it's going to be like a masterpiece. It's just, it's just like a different kind of uh, way to spend your time. Are you looking for a gem somewhere hidden in there? Right? Or do you want just perfect masterpiece every single second of the show has been looked over by 20 people costumes are on point and they got it from the grandmother of someone who was actually living at the time you know it's just like what are you into i would consider reality tv thrifting and i would consider documentaries like high-end niche specific things um i'm gonna end on this topic of i was watching <clears throat> the what is that song called that they made with all the artists yeah we are the world i was watching how we are the world was made oh my god it blew my mind they got 47 a-list actors and actresses in the same singers in the same room during the amas um, I can't imagine what that was like to get all those people into the same room. And the 47 people produced one song and they got 347 million listens or albums or whatever. It just like that super duper extreme version of the best of the best. Becky? I was just going to say, I'm sorry I'm not on camera this morning, but um, I loved Catherine's analogy so, so much. And I'm also a painter. I'm not good at it, but I love to paint. But just the idea of switching your business model is very scary. So, you know, you've, you've created something that you think is really good, like you're saying, but you know that something is going to be better. And just to wipe away that work that you've already done to implement something great is very scary. And um, so that's what I've been doing over the last two weeks is trying to source amazing items online. And then, so I've been waiting for those to come in. And in that time period, it's very scary. But I know that if I continue slowly, like the slight edge, just a little bit more every single day, and sourcing those better items that I'm hoping and, you know, hoping for the better outcome, but it is very scary. I actually think that Catherine's analogy is really good because it is like, not only are you wiping over you, like you're painting over it, which is like such a um, kind of a painful experience. And also like, um, it takes a while. So like, as you're painting over the tree, there's still parts of the tree you can see until you're completely painted over it. And then it's like that part of your reselling life is now gone. Yeah. Like, and, and as you're painting over it, you look at that tree that you painted and you're like, Oh, well maybe that was kind of good. Maybe I should go back and do that same tree because it's, yeah. it's what you're used to. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But I think change is hard, but it's necessary. So as you know of better and greater things, do those better and greater things. And as you become better at painting, uh, this is how I, I can justify. I know I can paint that tree again. So I'm going to paint a light post over it right now because I feel like, uh, you know, I want a light post is better. But if I've already painted the tree a bunch of times, then I know how to put it back. But I think it's it's worth finding the right thing that you're painting. It's like the... People are building up a lot, building a ladder up the wrong tree, that analogy. And I, I just, you know, you make sure that you're building the staircase to your heaven. You know, otherwise you get there and you're like, this is not what I was looking for. I feel like. This is, go ahead, Meg. Yeah, I was just going to say my issue at times is I never like make it all the way up the staircase I pick. And then I'm like, oh no, like, let me try this other thing. And 
then they're never none of them are ever fully like mastered if no. trying to work on that. well but the painting i'm working on now there are two other paintings behind it that didn't work and the painting I'm working on now is working, but behind it was a landscape that wasn't working. Behind that was a portrait that wasn't working. Um, Catherine, sometimes I think, wouldn't it be so nice to just know exactly what you want? Because then you could just do it. Because for me, my painting, the paint is like two inches thick. Because it took me a long time to figure out what I want. So the thing is, I've never stopped painting. But you get better with every redo. You get better with every oh, I'm, I'm over, so good. you know? I'm so good at spilling coffee on my painting and having to start over. <laughs> I'm a pro. But I mean, in reselling, right every building. every time you redo a process or, or restart how you are running a part of your business, you're getting better at it. And, the, you know, kind of the point of painting every day, even if that day what you put on that canvas kind of sucks. Yeah. You're still improving because you learn what didn't work. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, I think the painting analogy is really, really good. And I'll give you one more analogy. Sometimes you paint something and it doesn't match. Like, um, I feel like I had an incredible masterpiece of logistics getting ready to move into my new warehouse on april 1st i was going to run out of inventory this week move everybody to the new facility have a shipment arrive next week and then clockwork right on schedule but then there's a sewer problem at my new warehouse and now i have to wait like at least one more month for them to fix it so now i have two empty warehouses and i can't move into my new warehouse and i paid an insane deposit for the new warehouse on january 10th because I thought I could move in February 1st and we're now moving in May 1st. So it's like three month delay, all this crazy logistics, long commute. Because of that, we got in a car accident, like just on, on the new route to the new place. Like the, all these other things that, you know, are coming from this. But at this point, I'm, Good at I would say that I'm good at painting, but I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm good at physically painting, but I don't know if what I'm painting is any good. Right? But I can draw a tree. I can draw a tree, trees for days, but is it a good tree? I don't know. It's, it's to be determined. But that's a really, really good analogy. I think that um, I, I think this is this is the analogy for like the not getting better. Some people could paint a tree, right? And I'm sure that that painting could go for thousands of dollars, right? But other people could paint a tree and no one would buy it for even a dollar. And I think that's the analogy of like sourcing better items and getting better at your craft. Yeah, if I painted an orange square on a canvas, yeah. no one would buy it. But Mark Rothko, yeah. millions sure. of dollars. Millions of dollars, yeah. Do you know the Mark Rothko paintings? I do. It's yeah. like a orange square. And you it's saw layered, did you see, but did you see the documentary of the person that produced the fake ones? No. There was a person that um, spent 30 years of their life painting, professional painter, incredible painter. And he produced 12 fake Roscoe paintings that were perfect. Exactly. And even the family was like, those are definitely Roscoe paintings. <laughs> perfect. And it was like $63 million in fake paintings that the guy had painted. But um, incredible. Literally, the Roscoe family was like, I can't believe we didn't know he painted these. How do these exist? And if that painter is so talented, why isn't he just making his own paintings? He, he did. He was a very successful painter. Just not $63 million for yeah. 12 paintings um, successful. He was very, very good. It's just incredible that like... Um, you could do that. Like, um, and what finally tipped it off was one of the um, people researching the provenance figured out one of those colors didn't exist. He messed up one time. One color didn't exist back then. Oh. And the um, the person was like, "Oh my god, these are not these are not 
old. This this is this is new, so this is a fake. But Wow. it took a really long time. It was like a long time where this person was getting away with it because it was just they were just perfect. But there's a documentary on Netflix about it. Because I'll have his to look paintings that up. are some somewhat easy to copy. Right? But I mean that's that's uh that's so incredible. Can you imagine? Like But art is so rare. People want it and then they don't. Um, so yeah, I think Becky's analogy is a good way to end the call. She said, most artists don't know if it's good or not, but customers will tell you if it's good enough because they'll buy it. Wow, that's a cool fact, Jamie. All right, guys. Thank you, everybody. We will um, switch to...